can hear you. Yep. Okay, well, today is uh, Professor Sonia LeBlanc is giving a talk in the CDEC webinar. Sonia is uh, in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at George Washington University. Sonia's research focuses on material science, energy conversion, and energy transport or thermal transport, work that involves nano engineering and various types of advanced manufacturing. Uh, she was also a partner in CDAC from uh, 2017 to 2019, where she contributed to the center's activities in these areas. And she also uh, began working more with the NNSA labs, which also have a strong interest in this. Uh, Sonia is also very active in undergraduate education and science literacy. Sonia earned her bachelor's from Georgia Tech and has a master's from Cambridge University and a PhD from Stanford, uh, the latter in mechanical engineering with a minor in material science. So Sonia, over to you. Today, she's gonna be tell telling us about uh, uh, laser uh, additive manufacturing. Can you pull up your slides? There we go. All right, you seeing everything clearly? Very good. Okay, okay. laser-based additive manufacturing of thermoelectric energy conversion materials. This is a topic, of course, of broader interest at the DOE, also in NSA, and is a new area of interest in CDAC as well. So over to you. Great. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to um, be having this conversation with you. Um, it's... It, I think you'll learn less um, from this than I will learn from you. I'm actually hoping with a, a room, virtual room full of um, material science focused uh, people that you can answer all of the questions that I've got. Um, so I've got a, a whole hour prepared questions for you. Um, I also in preparing this thought, oh, I should definitely focus on the science. And I wanted to be an engineer since I was 10 years old. You just can't beat the engineer out of me. Um, and so without the engineering, uh, this loses its story. Um, so there's quite a bit of engineering in here and you'll have to forgive me for that, but uh, it, what, it's what keeps me going. It's what um, inspired the work that we're doing. And uh, so I'll be presenting it in the context of our engineering kind of problem solving approach to this. Um, so my fascination is with energy systems, particularly thermal systems. Um, this, is, this is what I find so exciting. This semester, I'm teaching our undergraduate thermodynamics class, and um, the students either think I'm crazy for how excited I am, or it's going to motiv motivate them um, to continue on in, in engineering and hopefully go into thermal systems. Um, so I look particularly at high temperature systems. Um, and think about how do we improve the efficiency of high temperature systems um, and how can we integrate materials that um, not only function better at high temperature, but enable us to achieve some energy conversion outcomes um, at high temperature. And so that necessarily leads us to thermoelectric energy conversion, solid state conversion of um, heat into electricity using a temperature gradient to establish an electrical potential in the reverse, um, using that electrical potential uh, to pump heat. Um, so, but I, I look primarily at the power generation side of this. And so the, you know, when I got into this, um, it was very materials focused. The conversation around thermoelectrics was very materials focused of, you know, yes, it, there's this uh, thermoelectric device, it converts heat into um, electricity. And so you have this thermoelectric unit. And let me see if I can, all right, there we go. Um, you have this thermoelectric unit that, um, has relies on NNP type semiconducting legs in it. Uh, and a lot of the work when I started was focused on how do you actually improve the thermoelectric figure of merit? So how do you increase the CBEC coefficient and the electrical conductivity to competing um, material properties? And how do you reduce the thermal conductivity? Um, all materials property focused. Um, so you know the perspective from a materials perspective is that a thermal electric material requires good charge transport and you want to minimize thermal energy carrier transport. 
Um, and when I joined the field of thermoelectrics, um, the focus was very much on improving this material figure of merit, um, in part by improving the numerator, uh, the power factor. Um, so increasing the Seebeck coefficient or increasing the electrical conductivity, um, there it's very difficult to do both at the same time um, because they're connected. And I happened to enter the field um, at a time when many people were experimentally putting into play um, what had been you know, predicted with respect to reducing the dimensionality in thermoelectric materials and thus altering the density of states. Um, and because that C coefficient depends on the slope, the curvature of the density of states at the Fermi level, um, thus being able to um, engineer the power factor and increase the power factor of the material by um, reducing its dimensionality. At the same time, um, there was a lot of interest in reducing the thermal conductivity of the material also by mechanisms um, where you are introducing nanostructuring that will reduce the effective mean free path of phonons in the material um, because the electron contribution to thermal conductivity was directly linked to the electrical conductivity um, that was you know a little bit kind of out of play and so there was the focus and still is the focus on um, reducing the phonon contribution to the thermal conductivity um, by introducing the um, features in the material where you could scatter the dominant phonons that were the strongest contributors to the thermal conductivity, the phonon contribution to the thermal conductivity. Um, and so there has been a lot of work in nanostructuring thermoelectric materials um, to introduce this scattering length and thus reduce the effective mean free path. Um, and so it was for me very exciting um, to see the work that was coming out where people were developing um, nanowire thermoelectrics. They were doing nanostructured bulk thermoelectrics, so introducing nanoscale features, but within um, the bulk of thermoelectrics, and then um, creating super lattices. All of these are around reducing that dimensionality. Um, in the case of the nanowires, these are the silicon nanowires, um, showing that you could get a strong reduction in the thermal conductivity. Um, likewise, for uh, introducing nanoparticulates um, within the bulk of thermoelectrics, or here it's not a particulate, it's just a nanostructured feature um, within the bulk. Um, and then showing that with the super lattice materials, you could get an increase in the CBET coefficient. Um, so this was all very interesting from a material standpoint, but like I said, I'm an engineer. And so I came to this and I thought the, the issue that I'm seeing uh, as I was working on it, so I was working on nanowire um, thermoelectrics at the time. And, um, and I subsequently, after graduate school, went to work for, I was a research scientist at a startup company um, that was working on commercializing silicon nanowire thermoelectrics. Um, and the challenge was the, the kind of scalability of it. So as we focused on scaling the manufacturing of nanostructures, um, for example, through rapid synthesis of nanostructures, which is what I had worked on um, at the time, solution synthesis, or even um, like elect electroless etch of nanowires, um, which is you know, not solution th synthesis, but was scalable, wafer size scalable. Um, the challenge that I saw with that is it was kind of directly at odds with integrating nanostructures into devices. Um, so you have to have that integration um, in our case in, in order to get the, the thermoelectric conversion and have an actual a device that can do the conversion. And so I saw that these were at odds with each other. Um, the examples of um, having really good integration of nanostructures um, didn't scale with having rapid, large scale um, synthesis of the nanostructures. And so for me, the gap was that, well, you needed both, right? You needed to have that scalability of manufacturing and the ability to integrate 
these nano structured features into the device. And so I saw that as something that was missing, these manufacturing and integration solutions that allow you to take advantage of what was being developed on the materials engineering side. Um, and I saw this not just in thermal electrics, but actually across the spectrum of um, energy conversion devices. And I would say that, um, you know, this, this is something that um, is still a struggle uh, in terms of being able to scale and integrate um, the manufacturing of these nanomaterials. So I see that as an opportunity, the options when it comes to manufacturing approaches to enabling the integration of these nanomaterials that have this enhanced um, energy conversion contribution to the function of the device. Um, and so some of those techniques that have been shown, I think, are 3D printing or roll-to-roll -roll processing, spray coating, there are kind of any number of them. Um, but I do think that the manufacturing approach is integral to actually achieving solutions. Um, so I brought this perspective in, and then also, you know, the, as a mechanical engineer, I thought, okay, the materials properties are certainly important, but does what is the role of the materials properties in the system level performance? And so often in thermoelectrics, we just have the image that I showed before of kind of what a thermoelectric module is. It's the semiconductor um, units or legs, we call them legs um, in a module. But where does that module go? Where does that device go? Um, you will integrate it in up to a larger system. And that integration necessarily means that you have these electrical and thermal interface materials and boundaries between those materials. And all of that actually gets in put into heat exchangers that are interacting with your thermal sources or sinks in your system. Um, and what I saw in the work that I was doing in systems level analysis and looking at the materials properties contributions, as well as the system level components, is that I think there's a different way of considering the thermoelectric figure of merit. Um, there's a systems perspective. And instead of that um, material dependent figure of merit, if we think of a system level figure of merit, it doesn't depend only on the intrinsic material properties. It also depends on these extrinsic properties. Instead of just electrical resistivity or conductivity, it's electrical resistance. Instead of thermal conductivity, it's thermal conductance. Um, and that necessarily means you now have to start thinking about the shape, the size um, of the, the device that you're making. Um, it, that factors in, that's um, what's required uh, in terms of the system level engineering. Um, and so I explored this by developing a, a system level model um, where I kind of, this is a thermal circuit equivalent of a thermal electric device system. Um, so it's not an electrical circuit, but, you know, in, in heat transfer, um, we do kind of an equivalent thermal circuit. Um, and rather than do what uh, I think was traditionally done, where we say, okay, yes, there's this thermoelectric element here. It's got a hot side and a cold side. We're accounting for the Peltier effects and the joule heating in an elementary way here by just dumping the joule heating onto the, the boundaries of the thermoelectric. Um, what happens if you say, well, this is actually integrated into this bigger system that's required for applications, and you have to do that with boundary materials, and you have to do that with heat exchangers, does that actually impact the energy conversion potential of the technology? And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, it's easy to say that now, but you do have to kind of run the model to see that for something as simple as looking at what is the thermal interface impact of like the thermal interface material that you have to have to integrate this thermal electric device into a, um, a larger scale system, you, you have to have this thermal interface material. And so you could consider like the ideal interface and this is the power generation potential for an application. This is for an application in a um, combustion appliance. Um, the ideal, um, the typical uh, thermal interface material is a thermal grease where you have significant um, pump out where you get these like gaps, air gaps um, in the, the thermal grease because of the cycling over time or the aging and drying of the thermal grease. 
Um, in a like microelectronics application, you can use a solder, but it's not very robust to um, thermal cycling and mismatches in um, coefficients of thermal expansion for the between the different materials and the device. And then we also looked at, you know, at that time, some of the more novel thermal interface materials like carbon nanotube arrays um, and, you know, how close they would be to providing a more ideal interface. And so the story here is simply that um, these thermal resistances are parasitic to the performance um, of the device in terms of electric power output. Um, so we, you know, I, I learned that from the system level analysis. And then I had a question because this depends on the thermal resistance. Um, so, you know, the thermal conductivity, but it's the dimensionality associated um, with that thermal component. So the length and the effective cross-sectional area for the heat energy carriers to travel through. Um, I thought, well, you can change the thermal resistance by changing the shape of the thermal electric unit, right? Because I'm changing the effective cross-sectional area, um, I could change the length too. And so we wanted to explore this concept of changing the effective cross-sectional area, um, which changes uh, essentially the, the thermal resistance here. So the conventional thermal leg is, is this shape. It's just a, a rectangular prism, it's very simple. Um, and we wanted to look at what happens if you hollow out if you change the shape, um, if you hollow out the interior, or if you significantly change the aspect ratio of the leg along the direction of the temperature gradient, right? So you're changing that cross-sectional area, um, which is changing the thermal resistance. And as you can see from uh, these temperature gradients, there's a larger temperature gradient across the units that have hollow and layered geometries. And that necessarily means that you get a larger electrical potential across those units. And so in that particular work, we saw that you can get a 35 to 55% higher aerial power density for these simple changes in the geometry and the shape of the leg. Um, so this again shows that there's this kind of engineering component, there's this system level component to being able to actually impact the power generation potential um, of thermal electrics. Um, we wanted to explore this further in terms of the how this would look in application. Um, and so the um, the convention with modeling thermoelectric systems um, is most simply to just consider that you have constant temperature boundary conditions. That's actually not reflective completely of all applications. So there are many applications, for example, in waste heat to power conversion, um, where you have a heat flux boundary condition. And again, I knew from the system level modeling that those boundary conditions matter. So what we did is we took that understanding about how changing the cross-sectional area of the leg changes its thermal resistance. And we created these really basic changes in the shape of the thermoelectric leg to explore that effect. And we wanted to do it under really realistic thermal boundary conditions. And so we did it for a number of combinations of thermal boundary conditions. We did it for high and low temperature thermal boundary conditions. So high and low temperature, meaning something like where you would use a bismuth telluride thermoelectric, a low temperature boundary condition, and a silicon or a silicon germanium thermoelectric material at a high temperature boundary condition. Um, and we also looked at low heat flux and high heat flux boundary conditions. And then on the cold side, um, so with thermoelectric, because I mean, you still you have heat, you you want to get a large temperature gradient across it, but you have heat going through your thermoelectric material. Um, if you allow it to just kind of be passive on the cold side, you won't get as large of a temperature gradient across it. So you do have to consider doing active cooling, um, and that's actually um, an implicit assumption when people apply a constant temperature boundary condition on the cold side, um, they, they are saying that we will do, there's some kind of active cooling going on to maintain a cold side temperature. What we did is we said, okay, yes, let's investigate what happens in that circumstance, but let's also look at what are more realistic circumstances and applications where if you have say natural convection, you wanna be completely passive um, on the cold side, or if you do forced convection, and we did different levels of forced convection, um, and that comes at a cost, right? You have to use some power in order to achieve that forced convection. Um, 
And so um, what we did is we, we ran for all of these shapes, we ran all of the combinations of the hot and cold site conditions. So it was close to 300 simulations, which I'm not going to subject you to. Um, I just wanna point out some of the, the key findings. Um, and let me just clarify what's going on in this kind of busy plot. Um, the top, we're looking at low temperature um, material. So bismuth telluride, this one is doped with antimony. Um, and on the bottom, we're looking at a silicon germanium, so a high temperature thermoelectric material. And I wanna just draw your attention over to the right side. This is the traditional thermoelectric leg. Like you all might've in your labs have thermoelectric modules and you maybe popped them open and taken a look at them. And it's got a whole bunch of these little units that look like this. So what we wanted to see is, well, how does the performance, if I change the shape, compare to this? That's why on here you have a zero um, for this unit, because everything is relative to the traditional shape. And I just want to call your attention to the shape that was the most interesting. We call this the hourglass shape. Um, and this shape is the one that showed the greatest increase. So just over 100% increase, so just over double the um, power generation of the traditional leg. Um, and so that was very interesting to us um, that this shape showed so that it's kind of what you would expect because of the way the cross-sectional area changes. Um, and then we see that we, we see the benefit for other um, shapes as well, but we see the most significant benefit at the high temperature for this shape where we hollow out the interior. Um, so this is very interesting because it starts to tell us not only that, hey, maybe we should think about making thermoelectrics in different shapes, um, but how should we change the shape in order to get a higher power generation out of a thermoelectric device? Um, another aspect of the system level engineering is to, to look at the parasitic thermal resistance in the entire system. So a lot of those thermal systems that I had referred to earlier were, um, they, they have curved surfaces, like where the heat is available um, that you want, where you want to do the conversion of the, the thermal energy into electrical energy. Um, those are often curved surfaces and thermal, typical thermoelectrics are, are these rigid planar devices. And so they're necessarily, if you're trying to attach a, square thing onto a round thing, um, there's this big gap um, between the two. And that is, um, you're either gonna fill it with some material, which is gonna be a large um, thermal resistance, or you're not, and you'll still have a very large thermal resistance, which is all parasitic. Um, so really what you want is you want something that's conformal. Um, you want to be able to make something where you um, have as much thermal contact with your heat source as possible. Um, and then ideally you have this a larger area um, on the cold side where you can get cooling um, so that you can establish the, a larger temperature gradient across the thermoelectric. So I hope that this convinces you that we have to, we do have to think about um, what we do at a systems level um, in parallel to what we do at a, of actually engineering the material itself. Uh, and so I think the, the question is, well, why don't we do that? Why don't we just make thermoelectrics that are like this? Um, it seems obvious that we should do that. Um, and that the reason we don't is because of how they're manufactured. Um, it's how they're made. This is actually a manufacturing challenge. The way traditional thermoelectrics are made, um, on the top right-hand corner, I've got a picture of a typical thermoelectric module. And um, if you haven't heated one up, um, either accidentally on purpose too much, um, such that you at least refloat or melted the solder, uh, you can try it. You'll be able to pop it apart and take a look at all the thermoelectric legs. This is how anything you can buy them on Amazon. Um, this, is, this is what they look like. And these are made by creating an ingot. Um, you could either do the synthesis of the material, alloy the constituent element powders um, together, or do um, a, a growth of an ingot from a seed. Um, so different ways to, to make an ingot. 
You then take that ingot, um, you dice it, you polish the wafer, you metalize the wafer, then you dice it again into those uh, little rectangular prism legs um, and you metalize uh, typically again um, to do this interconnect um, raise or solder step to attach it to the electrical interconnects. And then you sandwich everything between these electrically insulating plates. So these are typically something like aluminum nitride, which are thermally conductive and electrically insulating. And so you can see that this approach to making thermoelectric devices um, really limits the, the shapes, the geometries. Um, the multiple dicing steps result in significant material loss. So that thermoelectric material that we worked so hard to perhaps nanostructure, you lose over 50% of it in the manufacturing process. Um, this is not a very uh, flexible approach to being able to integrate or engineer the interfaces. Um, of the thermoelectric device or integrate it into the heat exchangers and the larger scale system. Um, it has a lot of steps uh, in the assembly process and it's fairly rudimentary. Um, this isn't terribly advanced manufacturing approach. Um, and so, you know, when I came to the table and kind of had the freedom to step back and say, well, what do we want to do, right? Like forget what is actually possible and what I might know, but what do I want to do? Um, well, on a materials level, I for thermoelectrics, you know, this kind of energy conversion, I wanted to be able to engineer the material composition and control the material structure from the nano to the meso scale. Um, from a manufacturing uh, perspective, I wanted to be able to find a way um, that I could have tunable, customizable shapes and geometries um, for the device and the material units within the device. Um, and I wanted to eliminate assembly steps. And from a systems perspective, I wanted to be able to build the thermoelectric materials and device directly into the system level components. Um, as much as I can eliminate assembly of all these different components and just kind of build it into the heat exchanger if I could. And I also wanted the ability to engineer the electrical and thermal interface um, interfaces in that process of constructing my final system. Um, and so the idea that I had was, well, this is essentially kind of leading the way to a multifunctional material, right? We can rethink what a thermoelectric module is and think instead of these like sheets or bricks of thermoelectric materials that have hierarchical structure and engineered composition, and it could enable integrated thermal management and power generation panels. And as you can see from the illustration I've provided, um, one source of our funding uh, for this is from a hypersonics program. Um, so, um, so we certainly see opportunity there at um, particularly high temperature applications. Uh, so if you want to do this, how are you going to do this? You want strong, lightweight, customized parts with small, complex features. And hopefully what you can see from the images on these two slides is that led me to additive manufacturing. And before this, I didn't have a background in additive manufacturing. I learned it all on the job because I got to it through the story that I just told you. Um, I won't go into how we chose the additive manufacturing technique um, that we did, but we did settle on uh, laser powder bed fusion. And in this, let me see if I can, I had linked this to a video, um, but I don't seem to be able to click and make it play. I'm sorry about that. I did test drive it and was able to make it play before. Um, but I'll describe to you what the process um, is. The process is you lay down a thin powder layer of material and um, you, you have whatever shapes that you want um, programmed in. A laser scans across that thin powder layer um, in the shape that you want. It melts that powder material. So now it's solidified. Um, and you repeat that layer by layer. So this is 3D printing, right? You're building up something layer by layer. It's fully customized and you get to customize it at the resolution um, of those layers in terms of the kind of meso macro scale shape. Um, but we're, you know, for these materials, it's, we're not doing this with a, a polymer, right? We, we are doing it with a material that is higher melting point. And what I'm showing on the right is, um, some you know, ideas around um, 
heat exchangers that are made with additive manufacturing, right? There's this kind of benefit that you can get. And so the thought I had was, okay, well, if we're making heat exchangers with this um, additive manufacturing approach, can we just integrate this energy conversion functionality into it by integrating materials that do the energy conversion um, into the heat exchanger? Because I'm building it layer by layer anyway. Uh, and so just conceptually, what that means is that I would be able to create units in place in the shape that I want. Um, and the material that really precious thermoelectric material, which is actually also quite expensive because it's high purity, we can actually recycle um, that powder. Um, so and because I'm melting and resolidifying, I thought, well, I wonder if that gives me the opportunity to actually control the structure at a nano and micro scale so that I can actually control the structure um, from the nano all the way to the macro scale. Um, when we got into this, uh, I, I went around, I was very new to manufacturing, additive manufacturing, maybe not manufacturing generally, but additive manufacturing for sure. So I called up people, um, I missed um, various, folks in academia who really knew what they were doing in additive manufacturing. And I said, so I wanna try this out. <laughs> um, can I use your system? Um, I also called up vendors and everybody except one, I will give a shout out to um, a, a colleague of mine, Ala Alwani at Texas A&M, who perhaps maybe at the time was foolish <laughs> and said, yes, he was the only one who said yes. Everybody else said no. Um, these, there are very standard materials that you can do this laser powder better fusion on, and you're not putting this thermoelectric material that we've never heard of into our system. I understood that. Um, and I also didn't want to buy a, a pretty big tool um, and void the warranty and support on day one. Um, and so we learned how the tools work and we went ahead and built our own. And um, that is actually, um, easier for us to work with because we we do work with kind of these unusual materials, ones that are unusual to leave for how red fusion. And so the customizability um, of our setup, while it's not great for building big parts, really allows us easily to explore new materials. So we actually use the exact same type of laser that's in commercial systems. It's a continuous wave terbium fiber laser. Um, ours is a variable power zero to 100 watts. Um, I haven't had to go up higher than that. I consider getting the 500 watt system, but I'm usually well below 100 watts for the materials we work with. Um, the spot size is 50 microns. Um, it's a 1070 nanometer wavelength um, laser. And then we have this um, Galvo scanner. So the fiber laser feeds into this Galvo scanner. It's a set of mirrors um, that moves the laser um, across the powder bed. And we actually, um, we, I mean, we built the whole system ourselves, um, but we, um, have our own powder bed setup. So we actually bring in different powder bed setups depending on what we're trying to explore basically. So it's not a kind of a set powder bed setup we can bring in um, and we're constantly building new, new rigs, new components of this rig and powder bed spreading platforms um, to investigate the different things. Um, we have, it's called an air knife, but it's blowing argon. Um, and we have an oxygen analyzer that um, sits at the, the bottom of the setup. So we, we process an argon and we wait until we're at the limit, the lowest limit of our oxygen analyzer before we start processing. Um, that certainly doesn't mean that there's no oxygen um, in, our, in our chamber. Um, we actually use the, this bubble that we use is the, enclo the enclosure that's used in um, well, well, laser welding. Uh, so we were looking at how do we have something that is actually very flexible, um, and we found that in laser welding, um, this is this is what's used, um, and so it's it's been pretty good uh, so far for us. Um, so we we are still working with our customized system. We're constantly working on customizing it more, <laughs> um, and you know I will go into more detail of the, the extensive process that we went through to make this work. It was years of, of work to figure this out, um, but we have progressed quite a bit. Um, so we have made different uh, geometry parts um, using our, our own customized laser powder bed fusion setup. And we've done some material extrusion, a fused filament fabrication approach. Um, this is, so both of these are bismuth, actually all of these on this slide are bismuth telluride materials, um, some doped, some undoped. 
Um, and then we actually have um, two Department of Energy Advanced Manufacturing Office grants um, where we have built in um, two different commercial systems. The, some of the geometries that we had modeled in our previous work that um, showed that they would uh, demonstrate higher power generation um, performance. And so um, that's, I'm gonna take you through the journey that got us there, but um, we, we've made some really good progress. Um, typically in this laser additive manufacturing approach, when we kind of came onto the scene, um, people that were doing polymers and various ceramics and composites and alloys and metals. And I asked this perhaps naive question. I went in and I said, oh, can you just let me know who's done it on semiconductor materials so that I can go look at that work because that's what I wanna do. And we didn't find anyone um, who was doing this on semiconductor materials, perhaps for good reason, um, but it's what we wanted to do. And um, a lot of people are, are and were doing work with metals. Um, and so some, this things that characteristics that distinguish the materials that we're working with, the thermoelectric materials um, from the typical metals are um, that the thermal conductivity of the metals, um, those are, are much higher um, than these low thermal conductivity materials that we're working with. So even though the metals, it's all in powder form. Um, and so yes, you know, that increases the thermal effective thermal resistance, right? In the powder bed, even if you have a high thermal conductivity metal, um, it's still much higher thermal conductivity. You get higher thermal dissipation than we do with the thermoelectric materials. Um, the metals are much more ductile than the thermoelectric materials, which are extremely brittle. Um, and then, you know, as much as folks in the additive manufacturing arena complain that they, you know, can't get good flowability um, powder materials. Uh, they're not, you know, the particles aren't perfectly spherical, et cetera. These powders, which is a typical titanium powder used in a laser additive manufacturing, um, they are much, um, much better than what we're working with in terms of how spherical the particles are and how effectively they flow. Because every layer, these layers are tens of microns thick. Um, each time we lay down a layer of powder. So it's actually very important to be able to lay down a uniform um, layer of powder with really high packing density um, and do that repeatedly with not, um, not having significant gaps um, in, the, in the powder layer that you lay down. And so these are the kinds of powders um, that we work on. Um, so whenever folks complain about their powders, I show them ours <laughs> um, and, and point out we've done a lot of analysis of like effective diameter and how aspherical they are. Um, um, they're just not pretty powders to, to look at. So we did spend, you know, I got a lesson in powder metallurgy too. We did actually learn how to effectively spread these um, powder. So we didn't, um, we did obviously look into how to obtain spherical powders and realized we needed to move forward with the, the powders that we had. Um, so this, these are, these SEMs are images of the kind of powders that we work with. Um, and we are able to lay down layers with um, fairly high packing density. That's not our, our biggest problem. Um, we've tried a number of different materials. The work that I'll talk about here is focused on bismuthelluride, which is a low temperature thermoelectric material. Um, what we, it's what we started with because what I wanted to be able to do was compare how changing the processing of thermoelectrics from the traditional approach to this new laser additive manufacturing approach, how did changing that process impact the properties? And so I wanted to be able to compare it to a standard. And the only standard at the time that I started this um, was the NIST, NIST had a, st a thermoelectric um, standard reference material, but it was a bismuth telluride, or it is a bismuth telluride. You can still get, um, get the standard reference material. Um, and so I wanted to be able to compare whatever we made to the standard, which is why I started with bismuth telluride. It's not the best material from a laser additive manufacturing standpoint for a number of reasons, um, but it's because I wanted to really try to hone in on how the processing impacted the material properties when I was doing such a significant change in processing. And then for um, our current program, looking at high temperature applications, we've been working with silicon germanium. Um, I will say we've looked at uh, some other materials. We've looked at a cobalt silicide, um, for example, and kind of in the interim, 
for thermoelectric materials, we've looked at half Hoyslers, we've looked at um, some magnesium silicide materials, um, but the, the majority of our work has been in bismuth telluride and silicon germanium. Um, and we work with both material that is off the shelf, synthesized by collaborators, like in the case of silicon germanium, there's a local materials company um, that does synthesis of this material, and we synthesize the material in our lab ourselves. And so we can actually compare, um, you know, starting material and um, the, what the finished product um, when we've tried different kinds of starting material. Um, so laser additive manufacturing, like how do you get this process to work? How do you actually build up parts with this process? I explained how the process works, but the per process parameters that matter are things like the laser power, the scan velocity, how fast you're scanning the laser across the, um, the powder layer, um, how separated each scan is from the previous scan, the hatch spacing, um, and the layer thickness as well. Um, is another process parameter. There are certainly other ones, but these are ones that um, are, um, are kind of the common ones and ones that I can actually control in my setup. There are other ones that I can't control in my setup. Um, and so what we're looking for as we change these process parameters is getting fully dense parts. What's the combination of process parameters that allows us layer by layer to build up full, fully dense parts? Um, and there are regimes of this process map that um, are not conducive to building up fully dense parts. Um, so there's a regime where you get these keyhole porosity. Um, I saw that Tony Lee Rollitz on, on the call. Um, and so hopefully, I mean, he's probably, he knows all of this, but if you got to see his talk um, and hopefully you've seen it before, you've seen these like just, you know, beautiful images of that porosity forming these little, you know, pores that form at the bottom of the keyhole. Um, it's beautiful. It's not what we want when we're building up parts, but that's beautiful imaging. Um, so, so that is considered a defect. Um, I'd love to see how people might be able to exploit it. For example, could we exploit that to engineer the thermal resistance of the material? That'd be cool. Um, but another defect or non-ideal processing regime is falling where you got this um, plateau Rayleigh instability. And so it's exactly that. The material, you melt it and then it um, the surface tension causes it to ball up um, and it solidifies before it can actually coalesce with the material around it that's melted. Um, and so you get these kind of balling, um, we call it balling little balls that form. Um, or lack of fusion um, where you're not melting enough to get each layer completely melted to the layer before in all locations. Uh, so it's a lot that we're trying to, um, to deal with in order to find this really nice conduction mode melting regime. And here we've just scanned the laser for different process parameters um, over the powder to look at, well, where do we get that nice conduction mode melting? And we identify um, the region where, where you can get that. This is something that has to be done for every material. Um, and so it's, it seems very straightforward, but it, it was actually pretty arduous to, to figure it out um, for bismuth telluride and get to the point where we had done sufficient process mapping to find the regime in which we could make um, you know, not fully dense, you know, we're at around 88% um, in our own setup. Um, the, the DOE projects that we're on, where we're doing it on commercial tools, um, we were able to bring those, um, those tools up to the point of um, making 99%, uh, 95 to 99% relative density parts. Um, so we have figured it out, but it took a long time to do the process mapping and, um, and determine how to get fully dense parts for bismuth telluride. And so we're at the beginning of doing that with silicon germanium. I mean, it is a, a newer project for us. I haven't been working with silicon germanium for as long. Um, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to work with. <laughs> um, it, any, of, any alloy with silicon um, for this process is going to be difficult to, um, to work with. Um, and so the density is really different. You have electrostatic um, components to think of that are much more significant than um, other materials. And so with silicon germanium, you know, we had certainly identified the non-ideal um, uh, processing conditions where you get, um, you know, balling or keyholing um, or sometimes just ablating through the material. And so the regime in which you can conduct, get the conduction mode melting um, is actually 
you know, very small, or, I mean, you have to find some other way to actually make that regime happen, um, which is ultimately what we had to do. And the surface tension of silicon germanium is quite high. So, you know, here we're comparing, um, comparing it to stainless steel, you know, a more typical metal material that people are, are processing with laser powder bed fusion. Um, and so the, the impact of the high surface tension is, you know, if you have low viscosity and high surface tension, you get as a function of temperature, right? The, the, you have a temperature gradient across this melted, um, uh, you know, as, the, as you're melting the material, you have this temperature gradient. So the surface tension is changing. And so you get this um, Marangoni flow, the surface tension driven flow of the material um, as a result. And so we think that that's also happening. Again, I don't have the, the great um, imaging to, to show that that would be fantastic to be able to, to image this and, and investigate um, the, how this varies based on these materials where the surface tension is perhaps much higher um, than what we see in other more traditional materials or ones that have been um, investigated more um, significantly uh, in, in laser powder bed fusion. Um, so with silicon germanium, one of the things, one of the um, parameters that we saw was also important was the type of powder. Um, so not as much the composition, although we looked at different compositions, but in the different um, types of powder we looked at, the powder particle size was significantly different. And um, for the one from American Elements, we have no insight into how it was manufactured. So I can't hypothesize exactly, you know, well, I can hypothesize that I don't have a good basis for the hypothesis as to why their powders look the way um, they do. The one from the materials company that we collaborate with, they, use, they do large volume um, ball milling of the material to achieve the alloying. And in our lab, we use um, ball milling as well, but ours is it's much smaller volume. Um, and so we have to mill for a very long time. We get much finer um, powder particle sizes. And what we found is that the quality of processing actually depends um, on, on that, we think, in terms of the, the quality of melting you have to you have like really good melting. And it's hard to achieve that with this material. But what you see with that kind of medium-sized um, powder is you get the close, you get closer um, to the to kind of continuous melting, or at least the balls are larger. So there's promise there. And so we had to figure out, well, how do we, how do we get it there, right? How do we, uh, what do we do next? Um, and so we explored preheating the substrate um, to improve um, the wetting of the molten material to all of the rest of the molten material as the laser was scanning or to improve it to um, the material that was beside the molten material. Um, and, and that showed a little bit of improvement. And because of that, we decided to try a dynamic remelting process um, and so we, we come in, I'd love to have two lasers. That's what I'm working up to is, is building um, and, and building a new setup um, where I'll hopefully be able to integrate two processing lasers. Um, here we use the same laser and try to kind of do it, do it quickly where we're running the laser over it for the initial melting. And then we're coming back with the laser again um, to really get that coalescing um, between um, the the balls of material that had formed before right so this dynamic melting is what actually led us to being able to to build up parts um, in silicon germ germanium um, one of the things i mean this naturally you can start to see it here you look at this and you say well um you can investigate at least the link between the process parameters and um, the grain structure that forms. And we're interested in that because that grain structure gives us insight into how we might be able to influence the thermoelectric properties. And so that grain structure de depends on the temperature gradient and the solidification rate. Um, this is showing a cross section of a melt pool. So you can kind of see um, the grain structure that forms when you melt this material and it resolidifies. And then what we're trying to figure out is, and I don't have the answer yet, but how do we get um, to you know, the green structure um, that we, we might want? How do we engineer that? So the way that we're investigating that, um, linking the experimental um, techniques that we're using um, to uh, mo modeling of this um, approach is that we, we built a finite element model um, where we account for um, 
you know, the conduction um, mode, thermal dissipation um, in the power bed, the melting from the energy deposition from the laser, we account for convective um, radiative heat loss. Um, what we don't account for here is we don't account for the Marangoni convection, that, that flow um, of the molten material. And so that's not accounted for. So we know that there's some physics in here that we haven't captured when we're off, but it allows us to, I think, capture the key physics um, and investigate this dash line is for the same processing conditions. What we found as the shape that was formed when you melt the material experimentally compared to what you would expect to get based on the melting temperature, essentially like the temperature gradient in the material and seeing um, you know, what the shape is at the point where the, the material, um, everywhere where the material has um, exceeded the melting temperature. And so we're able to use the model to, to compare. And then experimentally, we can investigate green structure and we can say, okay, we, the, from the modeling, um, we have what the temperature gradient in the material is. And so we can, from that, because it's spatial and temporal, the model, um, we can say, okay, here's the temperature gradient and the solidification rate. And so we, from the modeling, we can do a prediction of whether we would have a columnar or equiax um, grain structure and you know, where the transition between the two would occur. Um, and then we can compare that to what we get experimentally. Um, and uh, so we, we have done some of that work. We're in the heart of doing a lot of that work. Um, and in part, we're doing this by modeling the microstructure formation. So we take the temperature gradients that um, we get from the finite element modeling after we've done some validation of like, we think the model is close enough because we compared it to experiments. And then we feed that into a kinetic Monte Carlo simulator um, developed by Sandia National Labs. And they have been fantastic at working with us on um, using, um, using Sparks for our application. And um, so what we've been able to do is now pull in the information from the, from the finite element model and determine the microstructure um, that's, that's predicted to form. Um, and so we can say, you know, what's, where, should, where are we going, where can we expect to get an equiaxed um, grain structure? Where will we see transition? Where will it be um, a columnar? And we do that, so we do all of that modeling of the predicted microstructure formation for the process parameters that um, we've also explored experimentally, right? So we're trying to, to look experimentally at, do the microstructures actually look like what we're predicting? Like, are we, are we getting this right? And can that give us into, insight into how we should actually engineer the microstructure? Um, and so, you might ask, well, okay, you're getting your temperature gradients and your solidification rates from this finite element model. Um, why don't you just measure that in situ? And so we're doing that um, in partnership with Open Additive, um, which is one of the partners on one of the DOE projects. And this is, I'm sorry, I don't know why the video is not working. It's supposed to, I'm supposed to be able to click on it. I tested it before this. Um, so if, if, you, if you undo the laser pointer, it will, and use ah. the regular pointer, then it will click. Okay. I think that's what happens. Is that it? Okay. Um, let me do that. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, so in the open additive system, um, this is, this is actually being, this is, this is telluride powder being processed. Um, it shows you a build laser scanning across it, it's building the parts, um, and uh, I'll let you see, see the whole build. Um, and so what's integrated in this setup are various sensors. And the one that I wanna focus on is that we have, there's a long wavelength IR sensor um, integrated into it. And so that allows us to get um, temperature maps. Um, and so, that those, these are the temperature maps. Oops, sorry about that. Um, these are the temperature maps that you see. So this is a kind of a thermal map of the parts. Each of these little rectangles is one of the parts that's being built. And so we can in situ get that, um, you know, the temperature, at least the relative temperature um, and get cooling rate from how that temperature changes. I wanna mention really quickly, um, one of the cool things that we've done is we have taken that and I said, well, 
this is essentially discretized temperature information spatially and temporally. You can just take the discretized version of the heat diffusion equation um, and you should be able to extract the in-situ thermal diffusivity of the material as it's being laser processed. And so this is work that we're doing right now um, where we've done it with the discrete data from the long wavelength IR sen sensor. And as a function of the temperature of the material extracted what the thermal diffusivity of the powder slash molten material is as it's being processed. We're verifying this um, a few different ways to see if this is an accurate way of the, determining the thermal diffusivity, but it's a neat capability that's added with that integration of the um, in-situ sensors. Um, so as a heat transfer person, this was, this was really fun for me. Um, I, I enjoy this. Um, so I just want to end by talking about the thermoelectric properties. Um, because it's perhaps the most surprising uh, thing that we saw. So in the black here, the black is um, the thermoelectric parts that were made um, in our setup with the laser powder bed fusion approach. And the pinkish orange um, is the traditional, like a melt grown uh, melt method um, or a hot pressed method. Sorry, it's a hot pressed um, samples with the same starting powder. So the same starting powder, we made parts using the laser additive manufacturing approach, and we took the same um, powder and we hot pressed it. And what I want to point out is one, we have a lot of porosity, so the electrical resistivity is high, but the CBET coefficient, they're opposite sign. Um, and we, we went back and I was like, this is weird. <laughs> um, we went back and really made sure that this is what was happening. Um, and, and I thought, okay, well, this is undoped business telluride. What happens if we dope it to be N-type? So it, it has to have a negative CBET coefficient. Um, and what we see there is that um, the melt grown material indeed um, has a negative CBET coefficient, but the laser processed material, even when it's doped with selenium to be N-type, is it indicates with a positive CBET coefficient that this is acting as a P-type material. And so we have in the thermal conductivity doesn't change that much. Um, so this was really interesting. And this is the question I have for this audience is, can you help me understand the defects that are causing this, right? So we've been able to do um, TEM to identify the nanoscale features um, like some inclusions um, also the regions where you have kind of segregation in this case of um, tellurium. Um, but I think that it's, you know, probably vacancies and anti-site defects that are leading to this transition. So how do we actually go about verifying that process? And how do I go about engineering the process, the process parameters themselves to control the defect formation so that I can control the thermoelectric properties? So that's my question to this audience. Um, and then I'm going to end by saying that we have amped this up through the DOE projects to kind of a whole new level of doing high throughput fabrication, characterization, integrated with machine learning to try to really hone in on linking the process parameters to achieving high thermoelectric performance. Um, and so through these projects, we've made now like hundreds of samples, and we have shown repeatedly that as you vary process parameters in some way that we haven't totally figured out, but it's definitely linked to process parameters, you can control the CBET coefficient, right? From a positive CBET coefficient to a negative CBET coefficient. For thermoelectrics, this is really powerful because it means that I can actually engineer the thermoelectric properties to tune it to the temperature gradient across the device. This is a way to actually maximize the power conversion in a way that like we, we haven't been able to do before. So this kind of ability to engineer the CBEC coefficient would be huge if we could figure out how to control it. Um, and so what we've done is we've actually been able to you know, measure all of the properties, CBEC coefficient, electrical resistivity, um, and thermal conductivity. And this is for undoped business telluride, but we've been able to bound then what the, we expect the thermoelectric figure of merit um, to be. And um, we are in the process of doing the same thing for silicon germanium. Um, and so 
during this time, NIST came out with a silicon germanium um, standard. So now we have a high temperature standard reference material for thermoelectrics, which is perfect timing for us. Um, and so we're able to compare the, the thermoelectric properties that we're getting with the laser powder bed fusion silicon germanium parts to um, the, the NIST standard. Um, but we are at the point where with silicon germanium, we're still trying to figure it out. The parts are very high porosity and we do have segregation of the silicon and germanium um, within the, the melted material. So we're still very much trying to figure it out. Um, and so I said, you know, we chose these materials because we wanted to compare it to a standard, but we also recognize that, okay, well, we should think about it in terms of what material should you choose? And so if you're laser processing, you want to choose something that has congruent melting temperatures. You want to look at, you know, what's the thermoelectric um, figure of merit for that material. And then we wanted to consider um, things like cost of the material and toxicity. And I'm sorry, so this is a, um, an industry funded project, uh, this particular slide I'm pulling. Um, so the table is, is not, I did that under my NSF career grant, but um, I'm not showing you the materials that we evaluated um, and I apologize for that. But we were able to hone in on a material that we were able to process within a week, figure out the processing and get really good thermoelectric materials and build up parts very quickly. And so we're, we're really excited um, about that. And I'm sorry, it's cryptic, but I knew that this was being recorded. So um, I can't disclose at this time too much, but I'm sure we'll be able to present it soon. Um, I wanted to point out that this is, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest in this. So they're added to manufacturing of functional materials for energy. Um, I was on the uh, expert team for this report from TMS that came out um, that covers energy related functional materials. And we've also done, because so many people are now working in this field, we recently did a review article on bulk additive, bulk thermoelectric structures made with different additive manufacturing techniques. And with that, I would like to thank my fantastic group of students and postdocs. They're amazing. Um, and a lot of support from, um, from different agencies, including NNSA. All right, thank you. And I'll stop sharing so I can see folks in the audience. Thanks very much for a fantastic talk, Sonia. So you put the audience on the spot. We need to answer yes, your questions for you. you have the answers. <laughs> okay. I need to do defect engineering. Okay. Anybody who wants to respond, just unmute yourself, put your question or comment or answers uh, in the chat or raise your hand. So maybe to start, you, you've done TEM, so you've got that to uh, sort of sort out at that level of detail, um, composition and structure and so on. Um, yeah, what, what else, uh, you know, we, we're in the business of doing uh, X-ray imaging you know, with uh, synchrotron radiation. That would be another thing to try to do, to try to understand uh, this really fascinating uh, change from positive to negative Seebeck coefficient in the same material. Um, lot yeah, of so I think the x-ray imaging would be a fantastic way to explore it because now that we're really able to identify which process parameters are causing at least positive, negative, and close to zero Seebeck coefficient, we could change those processing parameters while we're doing the imaging. So that would be fantastic. Yeah. Well, obviously, Tony wants to weigh in. <laughs> surprise, surprise. So, Sadia, thank you. First of all, thank you very much. Fascinating to see more detail about uh, how you actually print these very unfriendly from the perspective of printing materials. I was curious about the preheat. How close to the melting point do you actually take the bed at the moment? We don't get very close. So silicon germanium has a really high melting temperature and um, for safety reasons. So our preheating setup can go up to 700 C, but I only let my student take it up to 500 C. Um, I am not, because we are, our enclosure is that like plastic bubble, <laughs> a glorified vast plastic bubble. Oh, um, I just was not comfortable with, even though we did modeling to analyze um, the distance from the heated bed, you know, what the temperature drop is. Right. And the modeling shows that like everything should be fine. I just wasn't comfortable um, yet going higher than 500C. So we only go up to five. Right. Sure. Well, I was just thinking about polymers where you typically go really close to the melting point. I mean, right. as opposed to metals that are a lot friendlier. Well, uh, but that's why the two lasers. 
Any of the yeah, people of course. who are reading my oh, instrumentation? Yeah, yeah, of course. Because <laughs> the two uh, lasers would solve that problem. Have, have you considered putting it in an electron beam printer and simply taking advantage of the uh, the pre-sintering to stick the powders together and then melt them? Yeah, I have. Um, I have considered it. I haven't moved forward with like figuring out how to make that happen. Because um, right now it would have to be with a collaborator um, where they'd be willing to let us, you know. Yeah, mess up their electron source. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. I maybe okay. wouldn't say it that way. That's certainly not how I'm going to approach them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we've considered it and I'd like to try it. I'd like to understand that process better to hopefully be able to design um, the research plan. Um, but we, we just haven't moved in that direction yet. Right, yeah, it's interesting. Thank you. More questions, comments? So how far have you gone with uh, linking process parameters to grain structure to other properties, not the thermoelectric properties, but the other constitutive properties, the strength, the um, you know, equation of states and uh, spall behavior and so on. When you think about some of the yeah. applications in the DOE and in NSA, all those other properties. Uh, will not be far at all. And I, I'm definitely interested in moving in that direction for that um, industry funded, we kind of had this ongoing industry funded um, effort, we have for that explored some mechanical properties a bit, just a bit, um, but not in a way that I would say is comprehensive mm -hmm. retail. So I would be interested in doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, what is the target for the hypersonic implications? Um, so yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question. It was something um, that for that project, um, I hadn't proposed investigating too much. So for that project, the next step is, um, you know, once we've kind of got the consolidation and we can build up parts to moving towards some topological optimization um, and kind of demonstrating how we could do the integration of the thermoelectric material into the cold side of the heat shield, for example. And, and so what is the temperature range of interest then if you're on the cold side? So at the cold side, it's 2000 Celsius. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that's the peak temperature we, you know, then that's kind of what I've told the program manager. I'm like we can't, we're not going to go above that. <laughs> um, right. And so, you know, ultimately might it be interesting? I don't know of any thermoelectric material where you're going to get substantial silicon germanium is the highest. So I don't know of any where you're going to get um, the because the power conversion capability, you know, mm -hmm. really drops off at the high temperature. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure going above 2000 C, even if we could get kind of the materials to survive, how I would get the power generation capability. So, so yeah, on that point, is there interest in kind of um, designing from first principles or using AI ML to figure out what you know what the maximum is in a in an ideal material for those really really high temperature applications is is that something yeah. we're pursuing? Um, it's not something I'm pursuing, but I'd certainly be interested in having that conversation. I mean, those are the kinds of things where um, it's kind of at my limit, um, and I I really need to collaborate with the scientists who have that expertise mm -hmm. um, to be able to kind of join the two efforts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More questions, comments? Okay, if not, I thank think Steve you. came off mute and I didn't know. Uh, he just wanted Steve? to say I, hi. I put it in the chat, but- um, oh, okay. Go ahead, Steve, go. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so how, how tolerant are the thermoelectric properties of these um, manufactured parts or, or materials to variations in the grain structure? Uh, is there a limit to where it just kind of the process fails or? Yeah, I mean, I think the process fails not because the grains are too large, for example. Um, it, it fails because the materials are so brittle and the residual stress is so high um, that the material cracks. Um, so you might get, you know, a 
macro scale crack. We've mm -hmm. gotten that um, more often. We get something that's more micro scale. Um, and so you get like very small cracking due to the re residual stress in the material. Um, so that's what we've combated more um, and we haven't really seen um, a relationship between, for example, like larger or smaller grains, like columnar grains versus equiax grains and whether we, it seems more prone to fracture. And again, we haven't, we haven't explicitly looked at fracture. Um, but it, that would be interesting. Um, and again, with some of the manipulation of process parameters, we could maybe um, get to a point where we are relieving that res residual stress more effectively, and that will open up the process parameter space over which we could engineer the grain structure and then start to explore things like, well, what's the impact then on, say, fracture toughness? Yeah, I see. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you for a really nice talk. That was really interesting. Thanks for inviting me. I'm happy to do it. Okay, there are no more questions. Thanks again, and we'll all see you next time. All right, thanks. Bye. Thanks, Sonia. Thank you. Bye-bye.